you identify this body as that of your husband, George Loomis? Amazing Marilyn Monroe, from zero to 36 years old. Journey through the life of a legend. Join us as we explore the incredible transformation of Marilyn Monroe, from her early days to her iconic years. Witness the evolution of Hollywood's most timeless beauty. Norma Jean Baker was the name that she was known by before the world met her as Marilyn Monroe. Born on June 1, 1926, everyone knows the life of this icon ended all too soon on August 5, 1962, at the age of only 36. Marilyn's mother, not oblivious to the glamour and magic of the movies, named her child after Norma Talmadge, who ranked among the most popular of screen idols during the early to mid-1920s. Her name by birth would also echo 11 years after her death in Elton John's memorable Candle in the Wind, honoring the late American icon. The song was re-released in 1997, then in memory of Princess Diana. During the first part of her life, before she gained such huge popularity, Monroe endured a lot of struggles and suffering. For instance, she never came to really know her father, and she didn't have fond memories of her mother either. Monroe allegedly recalled that Gladys, her mother, tried to choke her as a baby while she was lying in a cradle using a pillow. Gladys was later admitted to a mental institution. Monroe spent a great deal of her childhood with foster parents. In fact, she was relocated to 11 different couples. She spent probably a full year at the Children's Aid Society Orphanage in LA. Later on, Monroe would also testify she was the victim of abuse and rape at the age of only 11. I think that Griffith was right in penalizing me. I don't really believe in ignoring traffic citations. At the beginning of World War II, Marilyn, still a teenager, was a Christian scientist and had already married her first husband, James Doherty. Therefore, she was Norma Jean Doherty for a while. She would later change religions, friend husbands, and names, and obviously jobs. During the war years, the shy-looking girl was employed in a military factory. One of her tasks was to spray down aircraft with fire retardant. Photographer David Conover was lucky enough to take some of the first intriguing photos of the future actress, singer, and model. In the photos, she could be seen working in the factory. Conover would be commended for discovering Monroe. He was assigned to the factory where she worked in 1944 and on behalf of the U.S. Army Air Force First Motion Picture Unit. The commanding officer of this unit was none other than Ronald Reagan, the future president of the United States. Conover eventually pushed young Norma Jean on a new life journey with his photography work. After this session, he recommended her to Bill Carroll, another photographer who was looking for a model. Carroll was reportedly looking for a girl who is the kind of kid you'd like to live next to. Norma Jean looked like the perfect fit. So she agreed to a session, and this generated her first income ever as a model. Carol paid her 20 bucks. It is also interesting that Carol didn't realize who he had really photographed for some four decades. He reportedly came across a news story in Time magazine explaining about Conover's pictures. Only then did he recognize this was Monroe before she became famous. After Carol, young Norma Jean sought out other opportunities to model. She also used different names during this period, including Mona Monroe and Jean Norman. Until she officially took Marilyn Monroe as her legal name in 1956, she also used names like Zelda Zonk, Jean Adair, and Faye Miller. The latest of these three she used when admitted to a psychiatric clinic. Perhaps her game-changing year was 1953, when she starred in the Technicolor musical comedy Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Around the same time, she also married her second husband, Joe DiMaggio. She completed two trips to Korea, where she was invited to entertain U.S. Marine forces deployed there for the Korean War. On one of the journeys, she traveled to the distant Asian Peninsula alone. Her audience was a group of 13,000 Army men. Monroe would later praise her trips to Korea as a life-changing experience and describe this as the first time she felt was a real star. Indeed, by that point, the star, the blonde bombshell, was born. Like, 
his dark star high. But beware when they start to descend. For her first few months on the 20th Century Fox lot, Marilyn Monroe landed no speaking roles in any films. Instead, she was placed in dancing, singing, and pantomime classes alongside other new contract players. She also posed for an endless series of publicity shots. With her talent for posing in front of the still camera, Marilyn brought an excitement and sparkle to her photos simply not found in the publicity shots of most other starlets. The Fox publicity department also manufactured a studio biography for their latest contract player, one that insisted that Marilyn had been discovered when she turned up as a babysitter for a Fox talent scout. Still pining for a dramatic role she could sink her teeth into, Marilyn got the opportunity she had been waiting for with the drama Don't Bother to Knock, which was released a few months before Monkey Business, but made at roughly the same time. Hi! Hello, Dr. Fulton. Did you come to play with me? No. Cast in the starring role as Nell, a psychotic babysitter who threatens to harm the innocent little girl left in her charge, Marilyn attempted to make use of her training and hard work to deliver a good performance, and perhaps deliver herself from a succession of dumb blonde characters. Dispelling these negative perceptions of Marilyn's performance in the film is this testimony to her skills by co-star Anne Bancroft. It was a remarkable experience, because it was one of those very few times in all of my experiences in Hollywood when I felt that give and take can only happen when you are working with good actors. There was just this scene of one woman seeing another who was helpless and in pain, and Marilyn was helpless and in pain. It was so real, I responded. I really reacted to her. She moved me so that tears came into my eyes. In addition to her dramatic role in Don't Bother the Knock, Marilyn starred in the Statement in Full episode of the NBC radio program Hollywood Star Playhouse in August 1952. She was cast as a scheming murderer a character that foreshadowed her role as Rose Loomis in Niagara, the film that would finally allow her to fulfill her hard-fought goal of being a genuine movie star. The role of Rose Loomis was tailored to take advantage of the sexual nature of Marilyn's image, yet gave her a valuable opportunity to stretch her rapidly developing acting skills. After many years of struggle, Marilyn had at last attained her goal. But at that time, as always, she understood perfectly who was responsible for her success. Marilyn commented, I want to say that the people, if I am a star, the people made me a star. No studio, no person, but the people did. On June 1st, 1952, Fox gave Marilyn a surprise birthday present. The news that she would star as Lorelei Lee in the film version of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. A smash success on the Broadway stage, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes had been running for over two years with Carol Channing starring as the vivacious Lorelei. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes began production in November 1952. Reportedly, co-star Jane Russell received between $100,000 and $200,000 for her appearance, while Marilyn was under contract for $1,500 per week. Aware that she was being taken advantage of, Marilyn insisted on her own dressing room. As she told the Fox executives, I am the blonde, and it is gentlemen prefer blondes. Marilyn and Jane Russell developed a strong, friendly relationship during the shooting of the film, much to the disappointment of the popular press, which was eager to report a feud between the two sex symbols. But gentlemen prefer blondes did have some genuine problems. It was during the production of this film that Marilyn's tendency to show up late to the set greatly intensified. Her makeup man, Whitey Snyder, realized that Marilyn was actually terrified to appear in front of the cameras and had to work up the nerve to begin the day's shooting. Though Marilyn may have incurred Hawk's wrath with her tardiness, he could not fault her for lack of dedication. Marilyn impressed many among the cast and crew with her willingness to work hard. She continued to rehearse long after others had tired, and she requested retakes of scenes she felt were not up to par. Marilyn realized that she had been given a choice role in a highly publicized film, a part that other, more respected stars had coveted. She knew that this was her chance for critical acclaim, her chance to garner some respect in the industry. 
Marilyn would eventually become notorious for causing difficulties during the production of her films, yet she managed to work with some of Hollywood's legendary directors in her brief career, actually working with some of them twice. Howard Hawks, for example, had directed Marilyn before in Monkey Business. Hawks always maintained that a great personality illuminates the screen, feeling that a successful end product made any onset difficulties irrelevant. Lively and good-humored, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is widely acknowledged as one of Marilyn's best films. It is a credit to the professionalism of both Marilyn and Howard Hawks that none of the friction between them interfered with the results on the screen. Be a bag of gumdrops. No, it was a square bulge, like a box for a ring. I think he's got a present for me. Marilyn's hard work paid off in the form of several well-executed, dynamic production numbers in which both she and Jane Russell, neither of whom were renowned for their singing and dancing abilities, sparkled. Marilyn's show-stopping Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend would become her signature song, highlighting her beauty and grace and also capturing the youthful actress at a high point in her career. In retrospect, the number signifies that moment in time when Marilyn was in control of her life and her destiny, a moment as fleeting as it was joyful. Reviews of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes were generally favorable, though many critics still focused on Marilyn's physical attributes rather than on her performance. Those few who did discuss her talents debated among themselves exactly how well she could sing or dance. A shower of awards for Marilyn would follow Blondes, including a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Learn more about this exciting time on the next page. Although the critics remained divided about Marilyn, the public had long since made up its mind that Marilyn Monroe was a bona fide star. She received a number of awards shortly after the production of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes that not only signified her popularity with the public, but also put her in the spotlight in more ways than one. In the spring of 1953, Red Book, a woman's magazine that had been generally favorable to Marilyn, honored her with its Best Young Box Office Personality Award. She had also won Look Magazine's award for Most Promising Female Newcomer of 1952. However, these tributes to her stardom were totally eclipsed by the circumstances surrounding an award given Marilyn by Photoplay Movie Magazine in March 1953. Photoplay dubbed Marilyn the fastest rising star of 1952 and presented her with a plaque during a prestigious award ceremony. During this period of Marilyn's rapidly rising stardom, it is easy to trace her life and career through a series of major publicity events. The negative reaction to the photoplay ceremony in the spring of 1953 soon gave way to more positive publicity surrounding the imprinting of her handprints and footprints in the forecourt of Grauman's Chinese Theater in June of that same year. Thanks to the box office success of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, Marilyn and Jane Russell were asked to appear together to place their prints and signatures in the cement. A hallowed tradition in Hollywood, the honor offered visual proof of an actor's stardom. In her tongue-in-cheek manner, Marilyn suggested that if these prints were supposed to signify a performer's screen image, then Russell should lean forward so her bust would be imprinted in the cement while she would simply sit in it. Air glittering on the screen, I can see my town in its party dress and see again those who shone so vividly across the horizon. During the first part of her career, Marilyn Monroe rose from a bit player to a bona fide movie star, even attaining her own star on the Hollywood Boulevard following the success of her film, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. How to Marry a Millionaire, Marilyn's next film, became the first comedy to be released in Cinemascope. If there was some trepidation that a comedy would not be able to make adequate use of the new widescreen process, then 20th Century Fox hedged its bets by featuring three top blonde stars in the main roles. Those supposedly based on a non-fiction bestseller by Doris Lilly, Fox executives discarded just about everything but the title and based the screenplay on a handful of plays that the studio owned. Lauren Bacall and Betty Grable co-starred with Marilyn in the film with William Powell, Rory Calhoun, David Wayne, and Cameron Mitchell rounding out the male half of the cast. How to Marry a Millionaire was directed by Jean Negulesco and scripted by the well-respected Nunnally Johnson. Marilyn's role in Millionaire showcased her talents as a comedian, which many biographers and industry personnel have suggested was her true calling. As Paula de Beauvoir, 
Marilyn played a nearsighted department store model who never wears her glasses because, as Paula soberly notes, men aren't attentive to girls who wear glasses. Paula's poor eyesight causes her to walk into walls, trip across the floor, and stumble on stairs. The sight of such a beautiful, voluptuous star as Marilyn Monroe blundering gracelessly into walls heightened the comic effect. Her work began to pay off in How to Marry a Millionaire. Though generally regarded as lightweight fare, the picture was a critical and popular success. Marilyn was singled out in the majority of film reviews for her comic performance, though, once again, critics were reluctant to admit that she was truly talented. On behalf of Look Magazine, I'd like to present to you the Look Achievement Award as the most outstanding feminine newcomer of 1952. Congratulations. Thank you, Lauren. And my thanks to Look Magazine. Marilyn was featured in three consecutive box office hits in 1953, a streak of good fortune that made her the hottest screen star of that year. Reviews of these films often singled her out for acclaim or attention, and she continued to receive vast quantities of fan mail each week. 20th Century Fox persuaded Marilyn to appear in the star-studded but hopelessly dated musical There's No Business Like Show Business by promising her the leading role in the film version of The Seven-Year Itch. Whatever the reasons for assigning Marilyn to There's No Business Like Show Business, Fox executives miscalculated once again in regard to her talents and image. Marilyn eventually became adamant, almost stubborn, about certain details or bits of dialogues in her film a habit that was probably caused by years of being pushed around and I'll be used by the studio. As soon as the movie There's No Business Like Show Business wrapped, Marilyn was ushered immediately, without arrest, to the set of The Seven Year Itch. Production began in Hollywood in August of 1954 and continued in New York the following month. None of the turmoil of Marilyn's personal life ended up on the screen. The Seven Year Itch is considered one of Marilyn's best films for a variety of reasons. The inspired performances by Marilyn and co-star Tom Ewell, the direction by Wilder, and the script by Wilder and George Axelrod. Though Marilyn's character of the girl may appear to be just another dumb blonde, the sheer force of Marilyn's talent and personality grants the character an innocence and dimension beyond the reach of lesser actresses. I believe in improvement. <laughs> and you're, you have been improved. Marilyn's ability to combine sexuality with a childlike innocence, plus the way her natural warmth and sincerity shine through her surface glamour, elevates the character of the girl above the level of mere sex object. The role of the girl was perfectly suited to Marilyn's screen image, and the seven-year itch garnered the actress some of the finest reviews of her career. With a few notable exceptions, Critics focused on Marilyn's flair for comedy rather than her shapely figure, even comparing her to the highly regarded comedian Judy Holliday. Aside from giving Marilyn one of the best parts of her career, the seven-year itch playfully acknowledged Marilyn's star status by incorporating elements of her own life into the character. The seven-year itch was released in June of 1955. By that time, Marilyn was embroiled in another dispute with Fox and had formed her own production company to secure better roles. There had been a few worthwhile roles along the way, but Marilyn was generally dissatisfied with the type of part she was assigned by Fox. She realized that the studio executives, particularly Daryl Zanuck, did not believe she had the potential to become a serious actress. Moreover, they did not want her to become a serious actress. She had been stereotyped as a dizzy blonde bombshell who specialized in comedies and musicals, and the studio would continue assigning her these types of roles because she had been so successful at them. Now we. Well, there they are. More millionaires than you can shake a stick at. I bet there isn't one in 75. 75, that's three quarters of a century, makes a girl think. In the few years since Niagara, Marilyn had gone from rising star to Hollywood goddess. Her salary had increased and her acting had improved tenfold. She had become the top box office attraction in America, as well as in other parts of the world. With the increase in stature came an added pressure, which was often magnified by the turbulent events of her private life. Despite the burdens of her personal and professional lives, and despite her status as a star, Marilyn decided to leave Hollywood for New York to study acting. She was determined to become a serious, dramatic actress, with or without the studio. Then, a bold move for any actor, 
The decision was particularly courageous for Marilyn, who battled more insecurities and personal demons in a single day than most of us will in our lifetimes. As another way to get more control over her career, Marilyn developed Marilyn Monroe Productions Incorporated. Marilyn, in high spirits, returned to Hollywood in February 1956 to star in the film adaptation of William Ng's acclaimed play Bus Stop, a property Milton Green had purchased exclusively for her. Marilyn's performance in Bus Stop, her first since training with Strasbourg, remains the finest of her career. In this classic film adaptation, Marilyn plays a sweet, talentless saloon singer who calls herself Sherry. Marilyn immersed herself in the role eagerly. She was adamant about the details that would contribute to the realism of the character and promised to walk off the set if her demands weren't met. Her portrayal is vivid and affecting. I figured it just isn't right to drink champagne in matador pants. Would you mind fastening my straps in the back? <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Arthur Knight, noted film historian and critic, raved, In Bus Stop, Marilyn Monroe effectively dispels once and for all the notion that she is merely a glamour personality, a shapely body with tremendous lips and come-hither blue eyes. Marilyn began work on her new film, a version of Terrence Radigan's play, The Sleeping Prince. Scheduled to produce and direct the sophisticated comedy was England's most celebrated actor, Laurence Olivier who is also slated to star in the title role opposite Marilyn. Included among the distinguished supporting cast was Dame Sybil Thorndike. The film version of The Sleeping Prince, later retitled The Prince and the Showgirl, was the first independent project undertaken by Marilyn Monroe Productions. Milton Green had purchased the property especially for Marilyn, and the unlikely team of Monroe and Olivier caused some chuckles in the press. Despite Marilyn's personal and professional conflicts during production, The Prince and the Showgirl has become one of the actress's most acclaimed films. Well-crafted and beautifully photographed by Jack Cardiff, the movie tells the story of a turn-of-the-century American showgirl who has a brief encounter with the stuffy Grand Duke Charles, Prince Regent of Carpathia. During the course of their evening together, the unassuming Chlorine reunites the prince with his estranged son, teaching the Royal Romeo about mutual respect and fairness. <laughs> oh, I can see. They don't call you the Fox of the Balkan for nothing, do they? <laughs> Am I called so? <laughs> Didn't you know it? Fox of the Balkan. <laughs> <laughs> the improbable teaming of Marilyn Monroe and Laurence Olivier does nothing but enhance this sophisticated comedy. The innocence and sincerity of Marilyn's character Elsie Marina, perfectly complements the pompousness of Olivier's Prince Regent. After the film was released to much acclaim, particularly in Europe, Marilyn won Italy's David D. Donatello Prize for Best Foreign Actress of 1958, as well as France's Crystal Star Award for Best Foreign Actress. Both awards are considered the equivalent of the Oscar, but Marilyn's chance for the real thing was denied her, as she was once again passed over by Hollywood at Academy Award nomination time. After The Prince and the Showgirl wrapped in the fall of 1956, Marilyn did not appear on a movie set until the summer of 1958. Almost two years had passed between projects, during which time Marilyn had attempted, not too successfully, to put some of her personal demons behind her. On August 4, 1958, Marilyn began work with director Billy Wilder on Some Like It Hot, a production fraught with horrendous fighting, debilitating health problems, heartbreaking disappointments, and harsh accusations. Yet, the film would be her greatest financial success, her most popular triumph. The tragedy of her life was that such extreme highs and lows were so often wrapped in the same package. Some Like It Hot was nominated for six Academy Awards, though Marilyn was overlooked in the Best Actress category. The film only won one Oscar for costume design in a black and white film. Still, Marilyn's performance did not go totally unrewarded. She won a Golden Globe Award as Best Actress in a Comedy or Musical and, once again, received sparkling reviews. As the decade drew to a close, the contradiction between the turmoil of Marilyn's personal life and the fame of her stardom became more dramatic than ever before.
to ill-fated pregnancies and increasing dependency on the escape offered by drugs and alcohol wore Marilyn down, making her distressed in private and even more timid with strangers. Marilyn's moods began to shift quite rapidly during this period. Though she seemed to accept the tragedy of her most recent miscarriage, she was not altogether happy with married life. Often, her disappointment took the form of vindictiveness or obvious disrespect toward her husband. She also began to alienate herself from many of her New York friends and acquaintances. On a more positive note, her drug intake decreased as she stopped sedating herself during the day, at least on some days. Still, according to some accounts, she was taking more drugs than her new California psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Grinson, thought safe. In July 1960, principal production finally began on The Misfits, which was Miller's Valentine to Marilyn. Directed by John Huston, written by Arthur Miller and starring Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, Montgomery Clift, and Eli Wallach, The Misfits promised to be a powerhouse film, as well as Marilyn's chance to prove her acting abilities. In retrospect, both statements are true. A haunting film with beautiful imagery, The Misfits is not only a provocative parable about the vanishing West, but a splendid showcase for Marilyn, cast in the most serious and challenging role of her career. At the time, however, the movie seemed doomed by Marilyn's personal struggles, which cast a pall over the production and threatened to overshadow the power of the film itself. Near the end of August, Marilyn suffered a breakdown and was evacuated to Westside Hospital in Los Angeles. As the mercury in Nevada topped 100 degrees, her pale body was wrapped in a wet sheet and carried into a plane for the flight west. Under the care of her psychiatrist and her internist, Marilyn stayed in the hospital 10 days while production was shut down. Is your fine woman? You're practically the only one who's ever been my friend. <laughs> well, drink up, kid. An apparent affirmation that Marilyn's precarious health was by then public knowledge, columnist Luella Parsons reported that the star was a very sick girl, much sicker than at first believed. Marilyn returned to the set the following week, though production would be halted periodically through September because of Marilyn's problems. Aside from the tenuousness of Marilyn's mental and emotional state, the production labored beneath the shadows of other potential disasters. Despite these obstacles, and despite Marilyn's dependency on drugs and alcohol, she gave a remarkable performance. But for all of Marilyn's efforts and the good work of the other people connected with the film, The Misfits opened to mixed reviews and poor box office results, neither a fair nor fitting end to Marilyn's remarkable career. As the winter of 1960 and 61 deepened, so did Marilyn's feelings of despair and hopelessness, though Joe DiMaggio entered her life once more and renewed their relationship. A close friendship developed between the former husband and wife, and the press spread rumors of a possible reconciliation. In February of 1961, Marilyn entered the Payne Whitney Clinic in New York at the suggestion of her East Coast psychiatrist, Dr. Chris. From the start, Marilyn was not comfortable at Payne Whitney. In addition to her precarious emotional and mental health, Marilyn experienced a variety of physical disorders as well. In May 1961, she entered Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Los Angeles for gynecological surgery. Because of her delicate mental and physical conditions, Marilyn did not work as an actress at all in 1961. Uh, that a thing of beauty is a joy forever. I want to tell you someday you're going to make a man a wonderful annuity. Now, come on over here a little closer. This is your television premiere, isn't it, Mario? That's right. It feels almost like making pictures. Ah, uh, yeah. Listen, I want to tell you something. Up to this time, yeah. television has been a medium, but now I say it's well done. Marilyn's February 1962 purchase of her new home and her winning of a Golden Globe Award as the world's film favorite in March would be the last two high points of her life. In April, Marilyn returned to 20th Century Fox to begin production on Something's Got to Give, an updated version of a 1940 comedy hit entitled My Favorite Wife. George Cukor was set to direct. Realizing that Marilyn was ill, the studio executives, Cukor and co-star Dean Martin, agreed to arrange the shooting schedule around her. Despite this consideration, Marilyn showed up for work only six days during the month of May. Toward the end of May, Marilyn made a quick trip to New York, Peter Lawford had asked her to sing happy birthday at a massive birthday celebration for President Kennedy at Madison Square Garden. 
The Fox executives were livid with Marilyn for appearing at the Kennedy Bash in New York. If she was too sick to show up for work, then she should have been too sick to fly across the country for a personal appearance. The event signaled a turning point in Fox's treatment of Marilyn. Henceforth, they would take a hard line. Marilyn's dismissal from Something's Got to Give coincided with a wildly chaotic lifestyle. She dated several men, took dangerous quantities of sleeping pills, and relied on daily visits to Dr. Greenson to see her through each 24-hour period. The last few days of Marilyn's life have been detailed many times in often contradictory accounts. On August 4, 1962, Marilyn spent the morning talking with her publicist, Pat Newcomb, and the rest of the day making phone calls to her friends. Dr. Greenson visited her for a short time in the early evening. The number of people who claim to have talked with Marilyn on her last day is phenomenal. Everyone from Joe DiMaggio Jr. to Marlon Brando, from Sidney Skulski to Isidore Miller. From her bedroom, Marilyn continued to make phone calls into the night. With each call, her speech became more slurred, a reaction that was not unusual for her during this period of heavy sedative use. Apparently, none of her friends were sufficiently alarmed to have someone check on her. Supposedly, Marilyn called Peter Lawford that evening to say goodbye. Then, sometime during the night of August 4th and 5th, 1962, Marilyn Monroe died alone, her white phone still clutched in her hand. Just as the press had hounded Marilyn in life, so they descended upon her in death, photographing her blanketed body as it was moved out of the house, into the ambulance, and away to the morgue. Pat Newcomb lashed out at the reporters for their lack of sensitivity, calling them vultures. The publicist may not have been too far off the mark, for one reporter was heard to say, I'm just as sorry as the next fellow about Marilyn Monroe, but as long as she had to do it, what a break that she did it in August. Marilyn's death was ruled a probable suicide. Her funeral took place on August 8th at the Westwood Memorial Park Chapel in Westwood, California. Final prayers are offered at the crypt. DiMaggio is strongly affected as he and the other handful of mourners depart and leave the earthly remains of Marilyn Monroe to the ultimate loneliness. Marilyn Monroe's legacy lives on. Share your favorite Monroe moments in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more captivating stories. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more iconic journeys.